Hello, this is Matt O'Leary, and this is an album rank, a full discography rank for one of my favorite bands of all time, straight out of Philadelphia. It's Dr. Dog. My good old Minnesota Vikings just had to let us down again. They were humiliated, to say the least, by the Eagles. And I've been trying to find, uh, like, a silver lining with this city, and it just kind of seems like the armpit of America. But I think, I think... It might be this band. Oh man, I'm salty. Dr. Dog put this untidy indie spin on 60s rock and psychedelia, mixing in blues and folk and soul and bluegrass. And they've just consistently put out records about every two years since 2002. So very steady, very consistent, very prolific. Uh, this is a worst to best list, but it's more like a great to greatest. And like most modern rock bands that incorporate these 60s and 70s rock tropes, they've definitely got their fair share of flack from critics who say they're hopelessly anachronistic. But to me, this amalgam of influences has always come across as a new creation. It comes across as sincere and, and just a genuine expression. And the more I think about it, the more I see Dr. Dog as a band out of time. I don't feel like they represent a particular cultural era or anything. I feel like they're just Dr. Dog and they remain Dr. Dog no matter what's going on around them. The most important element, in my opinion, to understand about this band is the Lennon-McCartney dynamic with the songwriting and the album construction. They have two main songwriters whose styles and voices are very, very different, but who just complement each other beautifully. First, there's Toby Lehman, who plays bass in the band, and he definitely leans more toward the immediate, punchy, bluesy stuff that's very, very visceral and very Jack White or Black Keys-esque. And then there's Scott McMicken who has this more nasally tenor voice and whose stuff generally has more chord movement and more uh, subtlety and he definitely takes a more whimsical approach. And every single album has this elastic back and forth forth between the two songwriters that really helps to balance things out. So let's get into it. At number nine, it's their first official, first proper album release. It's very lo-fi, it's very experimental, it's called Toothbrush. There's actually this thick staticky fuzz over many of the tracks and Toby's are, are very straightforward blues songs. I feel like you're gonna start noticing a little bit of a trend here. <sighs> let's just clear the air, let's just get it out of the way. I like Scott's songs a lot better than Toby's. I said it. This one's no different. It's the song Say Ah and Mystery to Me and the ABCs that are the clear and obvious highlights for me. They're very Alex G-like. Like, there's something about that Philadelphia lo-fi bedroom pop. Otherwise, beyond those few tracks, I feel like Toothbrush is pretty skippable. Next up, it's the band's most recent album, and one that was put up on Bandcamp with no previous announcement. It was just a nice little surprise. It's called Abandoned Mansion. It's such a subtle, just gentle opener, that song Casual Freefall. It's a little Twilight-like. The song Twilight, not like vampires. I just love Scott's voice on this song. It's so pure and so cute. And these philosophical lyrics too, like I'm what I am instead of whatever I'm not. And they keep it slow and easy on tracks like Peace of Mind or La Da Da. I love those seventh harmonies. It's so lazy river. The song I saw her for the first time just just makes me laugh. I imagine that light bulb moment. I think I'll write a song about seeing a girl for the first time. Brilliant. It's so just ham-fisted too. Like when she walked in, I held my breath. I thought I might just die. Let's just face it, McMicken, the dude's got one of the least sexy voices you've ever heard. But it's exactly that pathetic drawl that makes it so endearing and those regal dinner party strings just take this over the top. The song survives an instant classic with that galloping bass line and those little harmonized guitar twiddles. There isn't really anything to dislike about Abandoned Mansion. It just feels a little bit thin. It feels a little short. It feels 
casual and it doesn't really reach those massive climaxes they hit earlier in their career. At the seventh spot, it's their album from 2013 and it's the first one they recorded in their home built studio. It's called B Room. I would say these are some of their simplest tracks just as far as chord progressions go. The songs The Truth or Minding the Usher really play up this simplicity with an old vocal soul group sound like from the stylistics or the spinners while too weak to ramble is probably the most stripped down they've ever been it's just this folksy acoustic ballad with toby just wailing away with that signature sort of sort of hoarse ragged sound it's so vulnerable the song twilight's a definite highlight for me it really harkens back to their ethereal demos from their earliest recordings. I love how perfectly this song captures that late night woozy half mask stupor with those celestial synthesized harp sounds. Phenomenon and Love are probably my top two tracks from this album. Phenomenon's got one of the most complicated instrumental arrangements they've ever done. Hearing that bluegrass fiddle along with those weird animal collective synth glitches on that little interlude together, just what a bizarre combo. And that finger pick banjo just anchors it all. It's such a great song. Ultimately, it's really the simplicity of some of these songs like Distant Light or Cuckoo or uh, Long Way Down that just don't excite me that much. All right, we're continuing here on a new day. We got some fresh, natural, new sunlight. And yesterday we were just running out of natural light. So I was like, I don't want the video to look like an underground laboratory. So let's just start again. And where were we here? We got number six. It's another sort of newer album from a couple years back. It's called The Psychedelic Swamp. And this album is really interesting because it's actually a reworking of some of their earliest recordings as a group. I think their earliest stuff. Uh, and you can actually find the 2001 version of The Psychedelic Swamp on YouTube. And those recordings are, are rough. The instrumentals are shoddily performed and out of tune half the time, but you can start to hear the beginnings of their melodic capabilities. They've obviously cleaned up their sound quite a bit. The song Golden Hines got this singer where we're not used to hearing from the band and he's almost got this Elvis quality or Alexander Skip Spence. Swampadelic Pops got this early 60s bubblegum beat with the perfect blend of these swampy, earthy sounds and these 80s computer-driven synthetic sounds. And it's that juxtaposition you can see on this album cover and hear throughout most of the songs here. Like on the super catchy single, Bring My Baby Back, with its mix of these hydraulic air releases and these Morse code electronic effects and these down-home country tinge lyrics. Holes in My Back is this just grandiose but turtle paste interlude that leads into the best song on the album in my opinion was just fire on my back. And Dr. Dog goes punk on Bad Vertise, which is just a balls to the wall track. While the song In Love adds some refreshing female vocals. This album definitely stands out in the Dr. Dog discography. First off, it's a concept album, so it's more of a cohesive experience rather than just a unrelated collection of great songs. It's also super experimental, but that core songwriting quality definitely remains. And I'd say, you know, just great execution on this really interesting idea of basically covering your own songs. You don't hear that very often and they pull it off. The next two albums on this list bookend what I think is the golden era of the band. This one's on the back half of things. It's 2012's Be The Void. I've always thought that Toby had songs that translated a little better live while Scott had uh, the studio gems. And there's a perfect example of this with the opener Lonesome, which is this languid knee stomper and a live staple. Then you get Scott's How Long Must I Wait with its ramshackle harmonies and the submarine radar guitar line. Something I've always loved about Scott's songs are these nonsensical combinations of cliches and common expressions. It's just ridiculous. And in that regard, Do the Trick and Over Here, Over There and That Old Black Hole are three of his best. I tie my boots up tight and I head straight to bed. There's a pistol and a crystal. 
underneath my pillow. There's a tender heart inside that ugly armadillo. These are tears of joy, I cried the weeping willow. On Be The Void, there aren't too many instruments beyond the basics. This is a pretty straightforward rock and roll album. The closer turning the century being the exception with its Jimmy Page acoustics and its Eastern sitarish lead. Again, there's not too much to dislike here. It's just a bunch of great rock songs. And if you couldn't tell by now, there aren't too many lows with me and this band. It's pretty much great album after great album. At number four, it's the third album, We All Belong. And this one finally brought them some critical praise when it came out. Uh, while still keeping that lo-fi rickety charm from the first couple releases. It's a little bit tidier than their earlier stuff like Easy Beat, uh, which you'd expect, you know, they're working with more tracks and they're choosing to add all sorts of bizarre percussion noises here and there. Like the rattles and the zippers and the bottle tapping on my old ways. What a banger. You gotta go check out their Letterman performance of that, which is their big, you know, network television debut and they play it about twice as fast. Like seriously, it is flying compared to this recorded version and they're just killing it. Like the passion and the raw energy is just overwhelming. Go check it out. And those 1920s sort of Americana background trio of lady singers is just, the song The Girl finds Dr. Dog at their most heavy psych rock with this fuzzed out riff and this gunshot snare. In my mind, We All Belongs where they started to solidify this My Morning Jacket comparison. It's all got this rollicking southern flavor and you're gonna hear that on songs like Alaska or uh, the opener, Old News, it's a classic. The raw, unfiltered, eight-track brilliance of Easy Beat comes in at number three. This album's just bursting with swagger. Like, there's such a sincere love of music in every moment. And they employ more than a few classic rockisms throughout the album, like the echoing toms or the cacophony of wistful vocal harmonies on The World May Never Know. Do, 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 do. Shoo up, shoo up. I love the eerie guitar soloing at the end of The Pretender, that dusty organic riff that sounds like the band or Wilco. Oh No is just a bonkers non-linear prog journey that takes us from this suave rock and roll to this middle section that's almost day in the life-esque. It's got this didgeridoo sound that accompanies this uh, just the most childish, dreamy vocals. Oh man, then that ending is just such a crowd pleaser. It's silly, it's goofy, but you can tell Dr. Dog are in on the joke. It's not naive, even though the vocals sound like a strangled six-year-old most of the time. Easy Beat is the bridge between the concise pop songwriting of We All Belong and the eccentricity of Toothbrush. It's such a unique and fantastic album. All right, now we're getting into the cream of the crop here. These are the albums where I think not only is every song magic, but the whole experience of the album is greater than the sum of its parts. At number two, it's the very first album I heard by Dr. Dog, and one that brings me right back to high school. It's 2008's Fate, and this is easily the best batch of Toby songs, in my opinion. Hang On, and Army of Ancients, and The Ark, and... 100 years and the beach run the gamut emotionally from lovesick desperation to existential exasperation. I think the biggest gap in production value between any two albums is between We All Belong, the last one, and this one, Fate. There's just this crispness and this clarity right from the get-go. The opener, The Breeze, is an amazing builder of a track with this familiar chromatic dissension and these dense and sublime vocal harmonies. Miles Davis called the seventh interval a butter note, and that's because it's so commonly used, and Fate is just filled with butter notes. Like, all over the place, they create this nostalgic longing effect. One of my favorite moments is that snare roll on the chorus of the old days, which you can imagine it with just a regular basic 4-4 beat, but it's about a million times more interesting with that roll. I also love all the string and the brass arrangements that add to this southern saloon aesthetic. Speaking of a day in the life, the song My Friend is the perfect album closer. It's kind of two songs in one like that. And in the second half, they, they revamp all of these melodies from across the album, and it rolls out with a train kind of passing and fading away, which is probably the most realistic fade out. If Fate at number two is Toby's best album, then Scott's is definitely number one. And this is an album I could listen to 
over and over again, just enjoying every single time. It's peak Dr. Dog, shame, shame. The song Shadow People's arguably their most well-known song. I think they play it at every single live show. And guess what? It's only two chords, that's right. There's something just so evocative about the lyrics. And the way they just build up those two chords. I just lose it when that steady eighth note comes in on the guitar and they're just they're driving and it's just growing and growing. In 2010, this was their first album on Anti Records, but there's not too big of a production difference. And I feel like that's how you can tell they're really good. Like they have a vision for their sound and no matter who's working on it, it's just gonna be them. And even with higher glossiness or more polish, that gruff and charmingly unrefined sound carries through. The production tricks never outshine the songs themselves. Any added touches or flourishes just aid in the already flawless melodies and song construction. And I'm usually all about crazy unexpected chord changes, but another one of my favorites from this album is Where'd All the Time Go? And that one, again, is just a minimal amount of chords. She gets dressed up like a pillow, so she's always in bed. I love the syncopated vocal lines at the end of the chorus or that wavering Mellotron. Some hip hop producers got to sample that. Thick Motown bass lines lead the way on Stranger or Later or Someday. Someday gets real moody with these percolating electronic drums and this hazy fog behind all the verses. And Toby delivers this calm, smoky vocal. Then at the end you get that kazoo-like guitar line that's happening in unison with some whistling and it's just so weird and awesome. The song I Only Wear Blue is such an anthemic statement of we are who we are and you can take it or leave it. It just feels like a victory anthem, like we made it, uh, we put these 60s bass lines and these uh, random yelps and these thick vocal harmonies in just about every single song and we like it that way. And I'd be remiss not to mention Mirror Mirror with that amazing bluegrassy section at the end. What good country or bluegrass tune doesn't have something about someone dying in a river. You tell me. I could go on and on about Shame Shame. This is a great album, my favorite from the band, and a great starting place if you haven't checked out Dr. Dog. All right, that's it. I'm interested to hear what you think about Dr. Dog. If you're in the, the group that really goes for this sound, or if you're in the group of haters who are just curmudgeonly. Either way, let's talk about it. Throw out a ranking for me, um, and, and let me know if you like these type of videos, these worst to best, which is the Anthony Fantano version that I didn't want to steal. Oh, Dr. Cat. Oh, Dr. Kitty.